Hello again. Uh, today I'd like to read the foreword of volume three of the correspondence of Sir Ernest Sato, British Minister in Japan. Now I will read it from this, which is the hardcover uh, version made um, on Amazon. Um, but I would like to, first of all, show you the other options uh, for purchase. Um, actually, this is um, this is from uh, Amazon Japan, but you can find the same on the other Amazon websites, amazon.com, amazon.co.uk, etc. Uh, so we've got here volume three, and this is the paperback version. Okay. Um, you've got actually a given, uh, that's the front cover, and that is the back cover of the paperback. Um, However, you will notice that you've also got here the hardcover, um, which I've just shown you, uh, and front and back of that. Whoops, let's see, hang on. let's get the back. There we are, there's the back. Um, and you've got the Kindle. Um, so that's the Kindle cover uh, in line with the paperback version. Um, so uh, what I think I will do, uh, I want to read the foreword by Dr. Jim Hoare. Um, and I think if I, I can probably read it directly from here. Uh, if I, let's have a look. Yeah, um, this is actually the paperback search inside the book function on the, Amazon Japan website, you can see the price as well, 2,273 yen. It's equivalent prices in the other Amazons. Okay, so the correspondence of Sir Ernest Sato, British minister in Japan, 1895 to 1900, volume three. Can I make that a bit larger? Yes, I can. Uh, so volume three is letters from diplomatic representatives elsewhere, colonial Indian, naval and Japanese authorities, foreign representatives in Tokyo, and miscellaneous correspondence, uh, edited by myself with a forward by Dr. J. E. Hoare. And this is the copyright page, uh, giving the history of the publications, first published with Lulu Press, but that was before it, it got a forward. Uh, and now, well, here are the contents. Um, preface, forward, and the PRO references, PRO 30 slash 33, as you probably know by now, if you've been watching these videos, is the Sato papers. And then this is uh, 6, 8 through to 6, 15. And on the right, you've got page numbers in the book, uh, not relevant to the Kindle, of course. Uh, and that since, ah, um, oh, yes, um, because this appears to go in sequence, but then appears to miss out 6, 13, I have a note here that 613 is letters from uh, R.D. Robeson, cha chairman of the Yokohama Chamber of Commerce. From the R.D. Robeson, that's wrong. From R.D. Robeson. Uh, this file is included in volume two relating to Yokohama. Okay. Right then, so on we go. Um, well, the preface, um, I don't think I've changed that much from the other prefaces, <laughs> to be honest. So I don't think I'll bother reading this through. Um, but I will read Dr. Hoare's forward because that is unique to this volume. Okay, here we go. Make it a bit larger. Forward. In the British Foreign Office General Correspondence, the records before 1906, now in the National Archives, formerly the Public Record Office at Kew, to the west of London, for the most part relate to individual countries, for example, for China, FO17, or Japan, FO46, and are filed on a yearly basis. In addition to the letters from post and the draft replies for each country, there are one or more volumes called each year domestic and various. These volumes would include letters from members of the public of varying degrees of coherence, a minor correspondence with other diplomatic missions and similar material. This volume of Sato's 
Sato's correspondence during his time as minister in Japan, 1895 to 1900, fits into that pattern. There are, it is true, few, if any, letters that are quite as odd as some found in the domestic and various volumes. Sato may not have kept those, but what is here is still a variegated mixture. Or variegated, oh, yes. The volume begins with letters from British diplomats outside Japan. These include the British minister in Beijing, Nicholas O'Connor, writing soon after Sato's arrival about China-Japan relations in the wake of the 1894-95 Sino-Japanese War. That war ended Chinese suzerainty over Korea and led to greater Japanese involvement in the latter country. So although the minister in Beijing was concurrently the minister to Korea and would remain so until 1898, Consul General Walter Hillier in Seoul wrote directly to Sato in the autumn of 1895 about the growing Japanese presence and its increasingly violent policy, including the murder of the Korean queen. That's Queen Min, I believe, yes. Hillier's successor, John Jordan, uh, John Newell Jordan, or John Newell, N-E-W-E-L-L, -E -L, John Newell Jordan, who was successively Consul General, 1896 to 98, then Chargé d'Affaires, 1898 to 1901, and Minister, 1901 to 1906, would also write from time to time as Korea was buffeted between the great powers. Um, his view of Korea, expressed in a letter of the 1st of March, 1897, was pessimistic. I cannot see much hope for this country. Another theme that begins in this section, but which continues to recur, reoccur, sorry, throughout the volume, and of course is fully covered in volume four, concerns Taiwan, usually at that time called Formosa. Taiwan was now a Japanese colony, not a Chinese province, after it was acquired from China at the end of the Sino-Japanese War. So for British consular purposes, it now came under Japan. As the Japanese moved into Taiwan, difficulties arose for British merchants and their Chinese staff as the new regime came into force. Consul C.T. Gardner of the China Consular Service, then at the Chinese treaty port of Amoy, Xiamen in standard Chinese, contacted Sato at the end of 1895 about one such matter. Sato appears to have gently chided him since Amoy was still part of China and he should have reported via Beijing. Gardner replied that he had contacted Sato since all the British firms at Amoy were extensively involved in the Formosa trade. Gardner's reply clearly turned away whatever wrath Sato had. In a conciliatory reply, he said that he had acted on Gardner's information since he could get nothing official from W.S. Ayrton, the consul at Tamsui, and agreed that Gardner had been right to draw his attention to the case. Like all heads of mission, Sato was in frequent correspondence with the senior naval officers of the China station, many of whom were old friends. There were important matters to arrange, such as naval bands to play at the annual Queen's birthday party. <laughs> Much of the correspondence is concerned with such relatively routine matters, such as naval ships movements. I found it particularly interesting uh, to see how frequently British ships visited Port Hamilton, Komundo, a group of islands off the south coast of Korea that Britain had occupied in the mid 1880s as a potential naval base and as a deterrent to Russia. However, while the Navy had long coveted the islands, the reality proved to be somewhat different and it was abandoned. Ships, accidents, sailors, fights, access to good anchorages while in Japanese ports and calls by the Admiral on the Emperor of Japan all provided regular correspondence. Senior naval officers could also be prickly about what they felt were breaches of etiquette by consular staff, such as failure to make courtesy calls on naval ships. The Navy often picked up useful intelligence, especially over Russian activities, and sometimes alerted Sato to developments in Korea and China more quickly than official dispatches. In turn, the admirals often sought guidance from Sato and no doubt from the ministers in Beijing about British policy in East Asia. Alas, as Sato himself found, there was little to go on from London. Little advice, I suppose that means, yes. Uh, far less interesting are the few letters from Japanese and those from Sato's fellow ministers in Tokyo. Most are brief thank you notes or similar routine exchanges. A rare interesting aside is in a letter to the Austro-Hungarian minister in September 1898, 
just after the assassination of the Austrian Empress Elizabeth. The letter itself concerns newspaper reports of a special arrangement in relation to court mourning that was claimed had been agreed between Britain and Japan. Sato explained that there was no special arrangement, but that court mourning would be applied when a, sorry, I'm going to miss out that footnote, um, head of state died. Although the letters relate to a report in the Japan Times, Sato implied that one in the Japan Mail was incorrect, adding that if it were in the same independent position as other English, sick British newspapers uh, in Japan, he would apologize for its comments. Sato had known Francis Brinkley, owner and editor of the Mail since the 1860s, and clearly had no doubt that the Mail was in the pay of the Japanese government, even if he was normally too discreet to indicate it so obviously. The longest section of the letters is devoted to a miscellaneous collection of correspondence from members of the public, both in Japan and elsewhere. Many are asking for introductions to prominent Japanese for business or other purposes. I might say that there's a similar section in the uh, Chinese correspondence, Sato's China correspondence. Um, Brinkley and another old acquaintance, John Frederick Lauda, formerly of the Japan Consular Service, seek his support for invitations to Japanese imperial garden parties. The requests were politely declined since both had Japanese decorations that had not been approved by Queen Victoria, but also perhaps because he liked neither man. As the date for the entry into force of the revised treaties drew nearer, uh, issues such as the future of the Yokohama cricket ground began to feature, as do questions about leases and the status of missionary schools after 1899. The state of Japanese prisons is another issue that comes up. There seems to have been a widespread belief that masses of foreigners would be jailed after 1899. Gosh. <laughs> Newspaper owners, including Brinkley, were concerned about paying Japanese taxes and other issues. A few inquiries relate to seeking work in Japan. Trade issues are often raised directly with Sato, by people who had known him long before he became minister. Where replies survive, they show a man who is always polite, even if sometimes he has to decline to become involved, such as a proposed campaign to encourage the Japanese upper classes to embrace Christianity, or a petition to get a special status for missionary run schools. There are requests to endorse visits to Japanese areas normally off limits or to obtain passports for travel in the interior. Sato seems to have always been courteous and to be as helpful as possible. All in all, with these papers, we have a fascinating insight into the multiple demands on a di diplomatic head of mission at the end of the 19th century. J. E. Hoare, September 2020. And then, well, this is um, page one. Uh, so it's the first letter in the book from Sir Nicholas O'Connor. Um, Correspondence and Papers, Private, Japanese Mission, British Diplomatic Representatives Elsewhere, August 1895 to June 1900. So, yes, I've got a footnote there about Sir Nicholas Roderick O'Connor and other footnotes, as you can see. And I've even managed to include his signature, N.R. O'Connor. And again, all right, um, so that's basically it for volume three. Um, thank you very much for listening and watching or just listening. Uh, and I will see you again for volume four. Uh, goodbye for now. Stop the share, sorry, stop the share and stop the recording.